Seeking the New Poetry, Walt Whitman. In Sri Aurobindo's masterpiece, The Future Poetry, he speaks of Whitman often and with great praise. In fact, he mentions him 32 times. Let us begin with Sri Aurobindo's definition of meter. Quote, Nevertheless, meter, by which we mean a fixed and balanced system of the measures of sound, mantra, is not only the traditional, but also surely the right physical basis for the poetic movement. A recent modern tendency, that which has given us the poetry of Whitman and Carpenter and the experimentalists in Verlieb, in France and Italy, denies this tradition and sets aside meter as a limiting bondage, perhaps even a frivolous artificiality or a falsification of true, free, and natural poetic rhythm. That is, it seems to me, a point of view which cannot eventually prevail, because it does not deserve to prevail. It certainly cannot triumph unless it justifies itself by supreme rhythmical achievements beside which the highest work of the great masters of poetic harmony in the past shall sink into a clear inferiority that has not yet been done. On the contrary, Ver Lieber has done its best when it has either limited its aim in rhythm to a kind of chanting poetical prose, or else based itself on a sort of irregular and complex metrical movement, which in its inner law, though not in its form, recalls the idea of Greek choric poetry. I would encourage all who love poetry and find in it an elevation of the word, as in Sri Aurobindo, to mantra, to read the future poetry, for this reason, I quote these words of Sri Aurobindo. Quote, Therefore, we hear constantly today of the philosophy of a poet. Even the most inveterate beautifier of commonplaces, being forcibly gifted by his admirers with a philosophy or of his message, the message of Tagore, the message of Whitman. We are asking then of the poet to be not a supreme singer or an inspired seer of the worlds, but a philosopher, a prophet, a teacher, even something perhaps of a religious or ethical preacher. It is necessary, therefore, to say that when I claim for the poet the role of a seer of truth and find the source of great poetry in a great and revealing vision of life or God or the gods or man or nature, I do not mean that it is necessary for him to have an intellectual philosophy of life or a message for humanity which he chooses to express in verse, 
because he has the metrical gift and the gift of imagery, or that he must give us a solution of the problems of the age, or come with a mission to improve mankind, or, as it is said, to leave the world better than he found it. As a man, he may have these things, but the less he allows them to get the better of his poetic gift, the happier it will be for his poetry. Material for his poetry they may give, an influence in it they may be, provided they are transmuted into vision and life by the poetic spirit. But they can be neither its soul nor its aim, nor give the law to its creative activity and its expression. There is something large and many-sided and constantly mutable in the life, thought, and spirit of today, which needs to express it sympathetically, vast and flowing movements, or, on the contrary, brief, sudden, and abrupt paces, or the alternation of these, and intermediate and variant lengths and turns. There is something at the same time densely full and singularly and minutely subtle in the modern thinking mind, which is, with difficulty, accommodable by the restricted range of subtleties, variations, and fullness of any given poetic measure. Why not then break away from all the old hampering restrictions and find a new principle of harmony in accordance with the freedom, the breadth and largeness of view, the fineness of feeling and sensation of the modern spirit, some form which shall have the liberty of prose and yet command the intensified heights and fluctuations and falls of the cadence of poetry. There is no reason why not, if the thing can be done. The proof of these things lies in the execution, but it may be doubted whether the method used is the right method. At any rate, it has not been fully justified, even in the hands of its greatest or most skillful exponents. It is used, as in Whitman, to give the role of the sea of life or the broad and varying movements of the spirit of humanity in its vigorous experience and aspiration, or, as in Carpenter, to arrive at the free and harmonious accession of the human intelligence to profound, large, and powerful truths of the spirit, or, as in certain French writers, to mold into accurate rhythm the very substance and soul and characteristic movement of soul states, ideas or objects described and seen. These are things that need to be done, but it remains to be seen whether they cannot be done in the recognized and characteristic movement of poetry, rather than in a compromise with prose cadences. The genius of poetic measure, walking in the path opened by the ancient discovery of cadence, beat, and concentrated rhythm, has not yet exhausted itself.
nor is there any proof that it cannot accommodate its power to new needs or any sign that it can only survive in an arrested senility or fall into a refined decadence. The most considerable representatives of this new and free form of poetic rhythm are English and American, Carpenter and Whitman. Whitman's aim is consciently, clearly, professedly to make a great revolution in the whole method of poetry. And if anybody could have succeeded, it ought to have been this giant of poetic thought with his energy of diction, this spiritual crowned athlete and vital prophet of democracy, liberty, and the soul of man and nature and all humanity. He is a great poet, one of the greatest in the power of his substance, the energy of his vision, the force of his style, the largeness at once of his personality and his universality. His is the most Homeric voice since Homer. In spite of the modern's ruder, less elevated aesthesis of speech and the difference between that limited Olympian and this broad-souled titan, in this that he has the nearness to something elemental, which makes everything he says, even the most common and prosaic, sound out with a ring of greatness, gives a force even to his barest or heaviest phrases, throws even upon the coarsest, dullest, most physical things something of the divinity. And he has the elemental Homeric power of sufficient, straightforward speech, the rush, too, of oceanic sound, though it is here the surging of the Atlantic between continents, not the magic roll and wash of the Aegean around the isles of Greece. What he has not is the unfailing poetic beauty and nobility which saves greatness from its defects, that supreme gift of Homer and Valmiki, and the self-restraint and obedience to a divine law which makes even the gods more divine. Whitman will remain great after all the objections that can be made against his method or his use of it. But the question is whether what served his unique personality can be made a rule for lesser or different spirits, and whether the defects which we see but do not and cannot weigh too closely in him will not be fatal when not saved by his all-uplifting largeness. A giant can pile up Pelion and Ossa and make of it an unknown chaotic stare to Olympus, but others would be better and more safely employed in cutting steps of marble or raising by music a ladder of sapphires and rubies to their higher or their middle heavens. Personality, force, temperament can do unusual miracles, but the miracle cannot always be turned into a method or a standard.
Whitman's verse, if it can be so called, is not simply a cadenced prose, though quite a multitude of his lines only just rise above the prose rhythm. The difference is that there is a constant will to intensify the fall of the movement so that instead of the unobtrusive ictus of prose, we have a fall of the tread, almost a beat, and sometimes a real beat, a meeting and parting, sometimes a deliberate clash, or even crowding together of stresses, which recall the spirit of the poetical movement, though they obey no recognized structural law of repetitions and variations. In this kind of rhythm, we find actually three different levels. The distinction may be a little rough, but it will serve. A gradation which is very instructive. First, we have a movement which just manages to be other than prose movement, but yet is full of the memory of a certain kind of prose rhythm. Here, the first defect is that the ear is sometimes irritated, sometimes disappointed, and balked by a divided demand, memory, or expectation. Here's always the prose suggestion behind, pursuing and dragging down the feet of the poetic enthusiasm. It is as if one were watching the aerial walk of a Hatha Yogan, who had just conquered the force of gravitation but only to the extent of a few inches, so that one is always expecting the moment which will bring him down with a bump to Mother Earth. It is something like a skimming just above the ground of prose, sometimes a dragging of the feet with a frequent touch and upkicking of the dust. For inevitably, the poetic diction and imaginative power of style fall to the same level. Much of Whitman's work is in this manner. He carries it off by the largeness and sea-like roll of the total impression. But others have not the same success. Even the French craftsmen are weighed down, and in them the whole has a draggled and painful effect of an amphibious waddling incertitude. But there is a nobler level at which he often keeps, which does not get out of sight of the prose plane or lift up above all its gravitation, but still has a certain poetic power, greatness, and nobility of movement. But it is still below what an equal force would have given in the master measures of poetry. But the possibilities of an instrument have to be judged by its greatest effects. And there are poems lines, passages, in which Whitman strikes out a harmony which has no kinship to nor any memory of the prose gravitation. But it is as far above it as anything done in the great metrical cadences. And here, and not only in Whitman, but in all writers in this form who rise to that height, we find that consciously or unconsciously, they arrive at the same secret principle. And that is the essential principle of Greek 
choric, and dithyrambic poetry turn to the law of a language which has not the strong resource of quantity. Arnold deliberately attempted such an adaptation, but in spite of beautiful passages, with scant success. Still, when he writes such a line as, the too vast orb of her fate, it is this choric movement that he reproduces. Whitman's first poem in Sea Drift and a number of others are written partly or throughout in this manner. End quote. I will read Sea Drift in a forthcoming series. Sri Aurobindo continues. It is evident that Whitman and Carpenter could not have expressed themselves altogether in the existing forms, even if they had made the attempt. But if the new age is to express itself with the highest poetical power, it must be by new discoveries within the principle of the intenser poetical rhythm. The recent or living masters may not have done this, though we may claim that some beginnings have been made. But the new age is only at its commencement. The decisive departures, the unforeseen creations, may yet be due, which will equip it with an instrument or many instruments suited to the largeness, depth, and subtlety of the coming spirit. The poets of yesterday and today, Whitman, Carpenter, the Irish poets, Tagore, but also others in their degree are forerunners of this new spirit and way of seeing, prophets sometimes but at others only illumined by occasional hints or by side rays of a light which has not flooded all their vision. But in the region of poetic thought and creation, Whitman was the one prophetic mind which consciously and largely foresaw and prepared the paths, and had some sense of that to which they are leading. He belongs to the largest mind of the 19th century by the stress and energy of his intellectual seeking, by his emphasis on man and life and nature, by his idea of the cosmic and universal, his broad spaces and surfaces, by his democratic enthusiasm, by his eye fixed on the future, by his intellectual reconciling vision at once of the greatness of the individual and the community of mankind, by his nationalism and internationalism, by his gospel of comradeship and fraternity in our common average manhood, by almost all, in fact, of the immense mass of ideas which form the connecting tissue of his work. But he brings into them an element which gives them another potency and meaning and restores something which in most of the literature of the time tended to be overcast and sicklied over by an excessive intellectual tendency, more lean to observe life than strong and swift to live it, and which in the practicality of the time was caught up from its healthful soul of nature 
and converted into a huge grinding mechanism. He has the intimate pulse and power of life vibrating in all he utters, an almost primitive force of vitality delivered from the enormous mechanical beat of the time by a robust closeness to the very spirit of life. That closeness he has more than any other poet since Shakespeare. And ennobled by a lifting up of its earthly vigor into a broad and full intellectual freedom. Thought leads and all is made subject and object and substance of a free and powerful thinking. But this insistence of thought is made one with the pulse of life and the grave reflective pallor and want of blood of an overburdened intellectualism is healed by that vigorous union. Whitman writes with a conscious sense of his high function as a poet, a clear self-conception and consistent idea of what he has to cast into speech. Sri Aurobindo quotes here. Whitman. One self I sing, a simple, separate person, yet utter the word democratic, the word en masse, of life, immense in its passion, pulse and power, cheerful for freest action, formed under the laws divine, the modern man I sing. No other writer of the time has had this large and definite consciousness of the work of a modern poet as a representative voice of his age. This inspiring vital sentiment of the nation conceived as a myriad-souled pioneer of human progress, of mankind, of universal nature, of the vast web of a universal thought and action. His creation, triumphing over all defect and shortcoming, draws from it a unique broadness of view, vitality of force, and sky-wide atmosphere of greatness. But beyond this representation of the largest thought and life and broadest turn to the future possible to his age, there is something else which arises from it all and carries us forward towards what is now opening to man around or above, towards a vision of new reaches and a profounder interpretation of existence. Whitman, by the intensity of his intellectual and vital dwelling on the things he saw and expressed, arrives at some first profound sense of the greater self of the individual, of the greater self in the community of the race, and in all its immense past action, opening down through the broadening eager present to an immenser future of the greater self of nature and of the eternal, the divine self and spirit of existence who broods over these things, who awaits them, and in whom they come to their sense of their oneness. This need is the sufficient reason for attaching the greatest importance to those poets 
in whom there is the double seeking of this twofold power, the truth and reality of the eternal self and spirit in man and things, and the insistence on life. All the most significant and vital work in recent poetry has borne this stamp. The rest is of the hour, but this is of the future. It is the highest note of Whitman. In him, as in one who seeks and sees much, but has not fully found, it widens the sweep of a great pioneer poetry, but is an opening of a new view rather than a living in its accomplished fullness. It is constantly repeated from the earth side in Meredith, comes down from the spiritual side in all A.E.'s work, moves between earth and the life of the worlds behind in Yeats' subtle rhythmic voices of vision and beauty, echoes with the large fullness in Carpenter. There are many more references to Whitman in the future poetry, but I shall end with the following. The note which has already begun and found many of its tones in Whitman and Carpenter and A.E. and Tagore will grow into a more full and near and intimate poetic knowledge and vision and feeling which will continue to embrace more and more, no longer only the more exceptional inner states and touches which are the domain of mystic poetry, but everything in our inner and outer existence until all life and experience has been brought within the mold of the spiritual sense and the spiritual interpretation. A poetry of this kind will be in a supreme way what all art should be, a thing of harmony and joy and illumination, a solution and release of the soul from its vital unrest and questioning and struggle, not by ignoring of these things, but by an uplifting into the strength of the self within and the light and air of its greater view, where there is found not only the point of escape, but the supporting calmness and power of a seated knowledge, mastery, and deliverance. The countries beyond the seas, still absorbed in their material making, have yet to achieve spiritual independence. But once that comes, the poetry of Whitman shows what large and new elements they can bring to the increase of the spiritual potentialities of the now widespreading language.